and as I say, welcome to my uh, talk show. And for people who want to know, this episode is on a long list of everyone. I know Woodbury High School, class of 2006. I'm going to interview everyone who went to that school. And you're number two. And I just want to say thank you for accepting my request. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Now, for people who want to know what uncensored is, uncensored is my way of showing people that even if we're in disability, I can still overcome controversy and reach my goals in life. At the same time, I'm able to turn myself into a perfect example for people out there dealing with any types of learning disabilities or disabilities in general, but you should never give up or have people label you, and you should prove to them that you can still mount to something. Never, you know, like the John Cena thing, uh, never give up. So, you know, in a way, I, I am taking John Cena's slogan and using it for myself, never give up. But it's true, and it fits for what I'm doing. Now, with that being said, it's half hour, 45 minutes of your time. Say anything you want, curse if you want to, gloves off. In a couple minutes, I'm going to pass the show over to you and put you in charge so you can ask me whatever <laughs> you want. So starting off, what can you tell us about yourself? Uh, well, um, right now, I'm currently working at a hospital and uh, I'm, as of now I am a certified nursing assistant who is going back to school in the near future to get uh, his nursing license. Yeah, that's really cool. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. It took me 27 years to figure that out, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, going back... Um, your school years, what did you enjoy about it, and what did you hate about it? Um, you know, it's it's interesting. You know, just thinking back, you know, when you were, you know, at that age, you know, all you wanted to do was just have fun and hang out with the cool kids, and you know, um, or just you know, just hang out with anybody. You know, have just I don't know, just go out and um you know, do what teenagers did back then. And, you know, when you were young, it was, you know, just thinking about the good times, like anybody, you know, the good times, you know, back in high school is kind of, you know, a euphoric state, you know, just, you know, pure bliss. And, you know, it just seemed like all the things were, you know, going right in the world, you know, and you had nothing to do but enjoy yourself. So, um, you know, I enjoyed a lot of uh, spending time, at, the, at Smith Cove Park um, with a bunch of friends, you know, playing, uh, you know, Frisbee and going out and, on bike, you know, playing on uh, bike rides and, um, you know, just going, walking downtown and, you know, kind of having, you know, you know, you just had this sense of, like, when you're a kid and you're just walking around town, you know, it's you and your gang of friends, your group of friends, and, you know, it's kind of like you own the place, even though you know you don't. But you just feel so so good and comfortable with your friends. It's just you know you can't help but feel good. And then um, you know just you look up, you know you look down the streets and you know you look over the lake and you know you you guys go out to the mall or you know go to a pizza joint or you know do do some stupid crap and you know in a <laughs> grocery store parking lot like riding around in the shopping cart. You know it's just. <laughs> You know, you're young, you don't know any better, and, you know, you just you just cause trouble, you have fun, you know. That's what I liked about um, those years in high school. And what I didn't like about them, um, you know, everyone gets picked on, everyone gets bullied on, and, you know, everyone has their, you know, you, people exclude each other because, you know, because of cliques, and, you know, you don't, you don't share, you know, similar interests or whatnot, and, you know, people shut you out and or shut you down, and, you know, um, I think the same goes for just millions of other other people that you know, you know, the school, you know, the high school. And it's just, um, you know, how they say like the brother and sister relationship is, you, you know, they, they the way people talk about, you know, oh, they pick on each other, you know, they sometimes they hate each other, sometimes they love, they have a love hate relationship, or sometimes they totally, you know get along and, you know, sometimes they have moments of picking on each other, it, it, you know, um, it was kind of like 
kind of like that. Like the part they hated about high school was, you know, the um, the times where it's like, you know, you had rough, those rough edge moments with your sibling. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. But overall, I think um, high school was okay, you know. And I think that the high school experience, it could be profound for some people. Uh, I guess it just, it just how you how you allow the experience to affect you. Um, even if you had a really horrible experience, you still have a choice to make a decision on how that's going to impact you. If you're going to just hold on to it and kind of you know let that control your life, where you just um, you know you'd be like, no, despite a horrible experience, I'm not going to let that. Uh, you know that that was just a phase. This is a part of my life that doesn't exist anymore. I still have control of my destiny, and I'm going to make myself into who I believe I can be. And you know, that's that's pretty much how I feel about my experience in high school and the aftermath of high school. No, I agree with you. Now, uh, next question I ask: Don't mind me if I get up. I have to let my cat out of the room. But the next question I was going to ask you was. Who were your favorite teasers? What teasers did you hate? And who were the hottest teasers that are in the school? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't remember a lot of names of teachers. I, I, I can definitely say my favorite teachers were, and I, actually, I still contact her to this day. I've actually met her a couple of times um, when I – because after I graduated from, um, from high school, I moved up to Vermont for eight years with my folks. And during the eight years I was there, I, um, one of my favorite teachers, Miss Liza Grzynski from Special Ed, um, you know, she was the definitely uh, a genuine and caring person and very good at um, just handling people and like and you know not like handling them, but like you know knowing how to. Um, work with kids with different with different kinds of needs, and you know that that's really hard to find in somebody. You know, not someone who's um, a compassionate, caring, and very skillful um, instructor who knows how to work with kids of uh, various learning disabilities. That's very rare to find. And uh, um, so I, I, I actually on my way down from Vermont. To North Carolina, I, I, you know, I stopped by Monroe just to meet a, um, a small handful, if not just like two people, and she was one of them. We we uh, actually got some lunch at Bright Star Diner, and she had a son that I got to meet, a little baby boy. So it was really nice to see my favorite teacher, you know, have a son. Um, yeah, Liza Gudzinski, she definitely was the best teacher in that in that school. The worst teacher. Um, you know, when I, and I can't really think of, I mean, I could probably, you know, if I try, if I spent, if I spent a few hours, I probably could think of a teacher and I mean, and just, I don't know if I'd be able to remember the name. I remember back in middle school though, I had a skills teacher. She actually was a special ed teacher and her name was Miss Pitcher. And that woman had some issues like you know that she was not hanging her coat at the door. You just know that, like she, like, a, 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 like she wasn't hanging up. She wasn't hanging her bag of problems at the door, and then just like walk in with like you know nothing to show for. Like she brought that. It was like a Santa Claus bag of broken dreams and like anger, just like following her around. But yeah, she, um, she actually had. I, I think she was abusive to um, not just me, but to, to other students um, in the special ed class. I think she had a problem with people with mental disabilities. And I remember the, I remember that month, I remember that, I remember that month that she, um, I, I guess she tried to commit suicide and take her children with her through carbon monoxide. Um, we like, like leaving the car on, and putting the, you know, putting the hose into the car, but it was really weird because I made a wild prediction that she was going to do something like that before that happened, and I, I don't, I've never made a prediction like that. I just, I remember she was really, like, getting on my nerves one day, and I said to myself, you know what, 
that lady is so fucked up. I think that lady is going to kill herself and her kids one day. And then two weeks later, like on the news, it's like teacher from Monroe, from Monroe Woodbury like middle school tries to commit suicide with her herself and her children. I'm like, Holy shit. Did I call on that? <laughs> but, <laughs> that was crazy. Cause I know cause my, and my mother knew that my mother knew that I, I made that assumption before that happened. And uh, when, that, when it happened, I came home and I saw the look on my mother's face and she's like, how the hell did you know? How did you, how did you know that was going to happen? I was like, I, I, I didn't know it was just some wild ass assumption. Like I didn't really think she was going to do it. And I just, I whispered it to myself, but like, I don't know. I must've had some wizard power that day or some shit. And just like, yeah. Um, now that, so yeah, that was probably the, I could name, I could think of a couple of other teachers. I just I actually, the worst teachers I had were from middle school. So I, high school was actually a pleasant transition. Um, I didn't really have any problem with anybody in high school. Um, yes, really for that question. <laughs> So let in the last one I was going to ask you, then I will answer the question on my part. Uh, well, who were the hottest teasers that you've seen and wanted to have as a teaser? <laughs> oh, there was definitely, there have definitely been a couple of teachers, you know, that, you know, you just think to yourself, oh man, this is like just so typical, like, you know, what is that, Wet High American Summer or, uh, what is but you know those you know those movies all about like you know the guys with the teachers and all the action that happens, yeah. Uh, or American Pie, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what's funny is that it never was the teacher that was permanently staffed. It was always the teacher that was just kind of like a foreign exchange student kind of teacher, or just a temp. You know, kind of like or like a casual. So someone who's just like substituting for another teacher for like a month or like like the semester, and you never see him again. Like. I just remember this one substitute teacher. She was smoking hot Brazilian like teacher. She definitely was. She definitely wasn't from around here. You can tell her. You can tell by her accent. She was just something else. Um, I can't. I think it was Miss Lopez. Um, and yeah, she, beautiful long brown hair. Don't really. I don't really. I don't really remember much about having her as a substitute teacher other than the fact that she was ridiculously hot and all the boys, like all the boys would just oogle and ogle at her, like as they're walking in, walking out and just talking about her, like during class, you know, but yeah. Um, I don't know. They're, you know, they, 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 the, the teachers, the teachers I found really, really attractive. Um, they've only happened about two or three times, like in my, in, in my, years from K through 12 and they, you know, it's been very, very far apart, you know, like one, one hot teacher in sixth grade, one hot teacher in ninth grade and one hot teacher in 12th grade. So it's like, you know, just every once in a while. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I answered the first question, you know, for attractive teachers that I saw, um, two come to mind. I would say Stephanie Antonelli. <laughs> so now I, yeah. she, she was very pretty she, for people who ever see Boy Meets World she looks like Tabanga oh gosh Tabanga yeah uh, is it a uh, is that how you, is that how you say your name yeah Tabanga Tabanga whoever thought of that name they knew what they were doing <laughs> and and the other one would be um Michelle Getson Getson yeah yeah, no, she was she was definitely hot. Yeah, I'll, I'll give her that. <laughs> now, the best moments I had when I was in high school. Uh, well, I can break it down like this. And if I hesitate, I apologize. Um, freshman year, I had my brother's friends who didn't graduate. Follow them, so they had them carry over for the other year. So, you know, I hung out with like a Max Case. Um, there's, um, uh, Dustin, I don't remember his last name, I just know his first name is Dustin, uh, there's Kevin, uh, there's Kathleen, she's a girl with the short hair, the kind of gothic, mm -hmm. um, Danielle Jure, uh, a uh, Elise Brown, uh, there's like a couple of other ones, uh, Jessica Miller, 
And that was the best part in high school because I had people to talk to. And funny enough, you know, Ka- Kathleen, Kevin, and Dustin, I don't know how this came about, but I was sitting by myself in a lunchroom, and that's how I spent my freshman year because I was anti-social. <laughs> <laughs> so they came over to me, and they befriended me. So I thought that was really nice of them. So ever since then, I was very thankful for them. Um, second year... Uh, actually, I met Mr. Roll. He's one of my favorite teasers going to the second part. Mr. Roll said, oh, no, not another. I won't give out my real last name because people know me as Andrew. That's my stage name. But Mr. Roll said, oh, no, not another blah, blah, blah. Well, we had your whole family in here. And that's the first time I met Mr. Roll. And uh, his assistant, I have no idea what ever happened to her. I'd love to catch up with her. And didn't do much with EV. I failed every class in freshman year, so I had to do it over. So, yeah, I got some bad parts in freshman year, but good parts where I got people to socialize with. Uh, Sophomore year, I uh, joined the audiovisual department. And uh, that's where I met, like, this, um, who do I meet there? Meg Kling, Brett Boyd, yeah. But so many that you're doing the best you can and you can stay in this department. Now, at that same time, I had this other asshole teaser. I won't mention her name on the air. I can tell you afterwards. But she didn't like the fact I was spending, and this goes to the subject of asshole teasers. Um, she didn't like the fact I was spending my time in eBay doing my talk show, working on my videos, working on my craft, and just yeah. how I got started with this. Yeah. So she used to call Mr. Ross and say, it's Keith there, he's done in class, and sometimes I used to hang out in the gym, so because I used to cut class, because he used to piss me off, he used to harass, he would harass me, he would harass my dad at work, it's, your son's doing this today, your son's doing that today. And like, Jesus Christ, lady, oh, man, my dad's a teaser. You call me out of class to tell me this bullshit? It's like, do your job. And that was a whole big thing my dad <laughs> My dad basically <laughs> put her in her place to the point where the teaser's aide says, you got to call his father? Oh, no, 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 I'm not calling his father. I don't know what my dad. <laughs> I don't know what my dad said to her, but he basically put her in his place. Her her price. But she used to call Mister Earl and Mister Simonson, who was another favorite teacher of mine. And it says to the point where they didn't want to answer the phone because they would come up with her name and the number. I'm like, oh God, is this is calling again? So when they never answered the phone, she used to come down in person. And one day, uh, you know, it's Megan McGugert, um, it's Stephanie, uh, Kevin, I um, uh, no, I just know his name is Kevin. It was the Morden Show people. Or all, there were just like 10, 20 people in the room. And she came down and she said, why is everyone just hanging around doing nothing or watching TV or whatever? And um, she came in. The next day, she ruined it for everyone. She complained about a base and it's a big so-so hangout, and maybe if it was. But she used me for an excuse. She told everyone I ruined it for everyone. So the following year, going to my junior year, and I don't mean to bitch to you, I apologize. It's okay. Uh, I can wrap up. <laughs> so junior <laughs> year, uh, Mr. O said there's going to be some new rules. You're going to be here only when you're supposed to. It's no hangout. So they got out the hangout room. They throw it out. And I came up. Do you remember with the morning show? I do remember the morning show. I I'm, do. I'm the one who came up with that idea. I said, wouldn't it be great? Because you have the radio station at the time. And you have TVs in everyone's room. Wouldn't it be nice to... Do a morning show. And I said, okay, well, you can, you can do it. We'll see how it goes. 
And I came up with a couple of flyers. We were talking about this today. I did it all by myself. We were doing this. We were going to do that. And as soon as I saw a bunch of people thrown in the garbage, I was like, no. Actually, I was like, fuck it. That's like, you know, that's disrespectful. I stayed up all night to work on this. And you guys looked at it like, and you threw it away. Like, it was absolutely nothing. And it was like a, someone sticking me in the heart saying, you're not going to mouth this end. And like I said, you're not the same people have you were back then. But still, I worked on that all freaking day. I wasted a lot of ink, you know, like 100 pieces of paper to make a professional. And the guys are like, and all the girls free say, oh, it's nothing. It's a bad joke. However, Mr. O liked the idea. And it's Kevin and Drew and uh, Jordan. And I don't know if Mr. Roll told him about the idea, but soon after, the morning show appeared. <laughs> and I said, hey, that's my idea. I would like to be a part of it. No, no, you have enough problems. And you have, and I, it wasn't your idea. What are you talking about? It wasn't your idea. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? But anyway, did they talk it and they ran or was it? But the truth is, I came up with it. Former students um, dug up footage. I think it was on a CD. And when she found it, she just uploaded it on Facebook. I can't remember her name, but I got to see. And she, it was like, a, it wasn't just a recording, like live, like footage. Like it was put through like an editing program and it was like, kind of like made into a movie with right. there's music in the background and stuff like that and transitions. So... But where was I during the food fight? Okay, so I don't know. Do you, I don't know if you remember Jack Litwack or Kevin Jacobson, yeah. John Heaney, Josh Cohen. So I was sitting with them, and we were on the like you go through the door, and we were on more of the east side, uh, like the south. Like we were we were a little close to the door, maybe like ten table, maybe like eight, like six seven tables away from the door. But we were on the east side, and all of a sudden, like, I mean, I heard some screaming. Like, you know, there, you know, there was like, well, like the cafeteria, the big, the main cafeteria lounge. There was, there was, there were segment, there were segments. Like, there was the ghetto area, there was the nerd area, there was the rocker area, there was the punk, and you know, the, that all that. So I'm with whatever my class was where my my group was and over i knew that the far right in the corner where the fries were being sold that's that's where the get that was where the um hip-hop r&b uh area was and there was lots of screaming and, and and like yelling and like tussling going on and as soon as that happened i looked to my right immediately a milk carton just hits me in the back of the head <laughs> And I'm like, what the hell? And then all of a sudden, there's just food flying everywhere. And I just huddle down, like, underneath the table. And, like, in World War II, like, you know, you just I, you just look to the sky, and it's just clouded with planes. You know, like, like, it's clouded with planes and, you know, rockets and shit like that. It was, like, you couldn't even see the ceiling. It was just... It was just a cloud. Like, it was, like, Clyde <laughs> with a chance of meatballs that went into Slipknot mode. Like... There was food and fries and subs and drinks and and soda pop, like just filling up all of the space in the sky or like in this like at the ceiling, and it was just un it was just surreal because it's like is this really happening? <laughs> like is are we actually in a food fight? Because you know you just hear about food fights all the time where you see in like you know a, a movie and it's like it's just exaggerated, you know, and it kind of felt like. One of those exaggerated, like drawn out food fights, because it actually, it what you were there, like we had to have cops come from out of county just to like step in, like it was just too much for security, to, like for school security to handle all these, all of these crazy teenagers selling food and shit everywhere. I remember, <laughs> like so plainly, I remember, like. This girl was wearing, and she picked the wrong day to wear white. Oh my God, she picked the wrong day 
to wear white. And it was an, it wasn't like a white t-shirt and white jeans. She had a nice Sunday dress on and it was just annihilated <laughs> by a foot long meat like meatball sub like and I just remember just clearly someone just taking the sub like like was there it was like forearm length just and I remember the marinara sauce. It was like a movie, like just in a slow motion, just boom, all over and sliding down her shirt. And the look on her face was pr- like, I, I feel bad, but I was also laughing on the inside. I'm like, I know I'm going to hell, but this is hilarious. <laughs> like, and just sliding down her shirt and you just see the look on her face. She's like, oh my God, my shirt. <laughs> just like, it was, it was priceless. And then I remember throwing... I'm, I tried throwing something. I didn't throw a lot of food. I threw a milk carton, and I threw it. I tried to throw it at some random kid that I didn't know, and he moved. Not not that he saw me throw it at him, and then he made the quick, you know, matrix move dodge. His back was turned to me, and just coincidentally, like, just, you know, by grace of God, he decided, or his body decided to make him voluntarily move to the, uh, you know, you know, just the side, like to the right side, it missed completely. And it, instead it hit one of the most notoriously, like, like it hit, it hit one of the most like notoriously, like just like ill tempered people, like in our school, I don't know, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth, uh, I thought it was that Bianca, Mun- not Bianca Munez or some. One of one of the Latin girls who were, were just known to be very, you know, just gun ready, like to throw down, fight, pull the hair, pull out earrings and shit like that. And she, the, what was worse than that was that this girl was on my bus. That's, <laughs> she was on my route. It was horrible. But, but thank God it was like the end of the year and we didn't go on the bus anymore after that. But I hit her and then I just quickly just ran away like, like – like, cause they were, cause you know, eventually like it got to the, the fight got to the point, the food fight got to the point where, you know, the room was split in half, half the people were on one side, half the people on the other. And I was on the side where all the vending machines were and shit. And I just, just tucked away into that big group of dudes that were like hanging out by the vending machine. But that didn't matter because this woman was so scorned and enraged and she knew where I, she knew where I was. She just, and she knew where I, I like. She knew where I was in the general area. So it's like when she came up, like I was behind these four rows of guys. And it was like it was like when Moses got to the river. <laughs> like for her, she was she was like Moses and like the sea of dudes just like spread out like just so effortlessly to ex- just to expose me. And she was like she comes up to me and she walks up to me in my face and goes, I'm gonna make your summer. A living fucking hell. <laughs> like, oh god, it's just. And thank God she didn't do anything to me. And so the fight, the fight still goes on, and it co- it carries out into the lobby area where Thomas Hunt um, had a two liter bottle of soda, and cops from out of county were like, oh, "Don't do it! Don't throw it! Don't throw it!" And you know, kids were sliding. You know. Oh, like on the floor because the floor was covered in like milk and like all this all this other crap and people were throwing powdered sugar <laughs> and and uh, I remember Tom getting tackled like gang tackled by like three or four cops like being like shoved off and then it just carried on into into the hallway like you know I remember riding on uh, one of my former classmates' shoulders like kind of turned the car on and it was just a lot of fun and and then eventually it got to lockdown mode and. I remember this kid that I was talking to in front of me, um, like his, you know, during the lockdown time, you know, everyone's cameras were, were confiscated. All the cameras that were in the building, like all the footage, they were looking at everything, trying to get, trying to find every single person that threw something. And I remember a security, like you know, it's it kind of felt like being like a chicken in in the hen house because, you know, you. You know, you never know. You would never, you'd never know if like you're gonna be picked or not. So it's kind of like you know, waiting for death. <laughs> like, like the security guards just come in and you're like, it's it's like the lottery that you don't want to win. Like, who gets picked? It's like I don't know. Um, 
So the security guard comes up, and she walks towards my direction. I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, I'm going to get picked. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to explain to my parents. You know, I got community service to do. And, oh, shit. And she keeps walking towards me. I'm like, shit, shit, shit. And she's closer and closer and closer. My heart rate just goes up and picks the kid that I've been talking to. It was kind of like, you know, kind of like the Jurassic Park movie. Like, um, you know, the, like you're trying to be quiet and the raptor is the, the philosopher, the philosopher raptor is like getting closer and closer to you. Doesn't know where you are exactly, but just knows that there's a human being in the area. Like the kid who like, like when the kid gets like when he's in the kitchen area and he like closes the door, like he keeps himself like locked in the, in the, in the pots and pans drawer. And it's like a philosopher, a philosopher raptor just like will walk by <laughs> and you just like hold that breath in and just like praying to God that like, <laughs> the philosopher raptor doesn't find you, walks past you and you go, <sighs> that's exactly how it was like for me. Just like that philosopher raptor just picked the kid in front of me and just walked away. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> so I never got, I never got caught. But the girl that I threw the milk carton at, she did get caught. So it's kind of funny. And then the print, but before all, before the lockdown and everything, I remember the principal um, getting a slice of processed cheese landing on his face and peeling it off and going, son of a bitch. It's like, <laughs> it was a very wild, funny time. It was, that was, that was, that was a great day. That was a great day. That was a great day. <laughs> so like I promised, I was going to pass this show over to you. Was there any subjects you would like to talk about or anything you want to ask me? This is your time after all. Uh, well, um, I, you know, going, you know, going from graduating from high school and, you know, to being here now, like in, at this point in, in life, it's, uh, it's interesting because, you know, you never know what the future holds and, you know, um, things happen the way you want, things don't happen the way you want, but even if things don't happen the way you want, it's, you know, still in your hands to, in your destiny, you're, you know, always are in control of your own destiny to, make you know make your life the way you want and um you know uh, i mean i've talked to some people who i went to school with and you know they went to college or they didn't go to college and you know maybe it's because they you know they had a child or you know they just you know they had to do some soul searching and had to you know find out what they really want with their with their life and uh, life's just interesting you know um and, you know, you got – because you got the friends that have their life together and you got the friends that are still figuring it out. And uh, I'm, I guess I've I've been figuring it out. I, I, I actually didn't really want to think about what I wanted to do with my life when it was come senior year. You know, all the people from college would – different colleges would come in with the booth and a table and pamphlets and you'd be like, what do you want to do with your life? And, you know, it's amazing when – when kids that age know what they want to do with their life. I mean, they may even have an idea, but then they might change their minds. And then there are people that don't know what they want to do with their life. You know, it's like you're asking, you know, you're asking a, you're asking a kid what he wants to do for the rest of his natural born life. I mean, that's a huge deal. I mean, um, and I didn't, I didn't want to think about, um, what I wanted to do with my life. I just, I don't know, I guess so. I wasn't ready to grow up and, um, I was very immature. I was, and uh, I, I don't know. I guess I wasn't ready to start thinking for myself and doing things for myself. Um, so there was like it, it was like a decade of growing pains and realizations and like just epiphanies um, throughout the ten years. But it really didn't that the, the that the growing spurt really didn't happen until I moved out from that, from my parents' house. I went to college and in Vermont and lived with my parents. I lived with my parents for the first six years that I moved up with them. I didn't move out of my parents' house until I was almost 25. And when I moved out, um, I was, you know, after, and I moved out right after I finished college. I, you know, I got my liberal arts degree uh, and moved out and I got my first career ever. I was in social work. I was a caseworker working in the developmental uh, disability department 
you know, working with kids between each, uh, you know, working with young males between uh, 18 and 26 with, you know, uh, a variety of mental and behavioral, you know, uh, mood disorders, you know, uh, you know, handling that, handling my first, um, handling my first polyamorous, polyamorous relationship, which I never will do again because I know now that I'm definitely monogamous <laughs> and learning, you know, doing, having a career, having a relationship, a different style relationship, nonetheless, that totally ripped my fucking head open and, um, learning about how young minded I've been for a quarter of my life and definitely for times in my twenties, um, and how much growing that I had to do and, you know, how much, you know, just how many issues that I had to address and, you know, I'm still working on myself, but I, you know, it's, it's been a, um, the last two years, um, or three, you know, the last two and a half years have been a, definitely a huge growth spurt, you know, um, being like, you know, first with dealing with being on my own, um, not living with my mom and dad anymore. And I had horrible fun. For my first roommates, it was bad, <laughs> just really bad. Uh, and, um, you know, so it was kind of, it was kind of tough. Um, doing all of that, you know, it, you know, for anybody, that's that's a lot. You know, in dealing with your first professional career, grow, learning to grow up, and 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 you know, addressing some deep issues that you know that have lingered on, like inside your psyche for a long time, and dealing with a relationship of a certain style that, um, it you know, you've never been in before, and it's put with your emotions a lot so whew, man um i i mean i don't regret my time you know at work and you know um just like i i'm glad that i had you know, like everyone has to go through you know to make any significant impact in your own life and, and make the growth you make those positive changes for yourself to be a better person you just have to go through that hell you know um and, you know, there's good times, there's bad times. And in the end, it's very rewarding, um, you know. And the ultimate thing is, is that you never stop growing, you know. I mean, if, you just, if you're done growing, then you're dead. You're six feet below the ground. You don't stop growing. You don't stop learning. It's, it's an ongoing – it's past school. It, you never stop learning. Um, and uh, I don't know. Um, I, I definitely can say that I've been a more um, – self-reliant uh, working on self-reliance uh being there uh being shown up for myself um and being accountable for making myself accountable for my own life and not letting people take care of me and just you know wanting to do it on my own and trying to you know prove to myself that i can take care of my own you know and, and uh it's you know learning how to be uh very um effective employee at you know, any career that I'm in, you know, overcoming confidence issues. And, um, I'm just exposing myself here. Cause this, I figure this is what this kind of show is about. Um, it's okay with you. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, um, I've definitely changed a lot the last couple of years. I think I've become a stronger person, um, and still a working in progress, but, um, just this year, you know, after many, many positive influences that I've had um, at my, well, my previous relationship that I, the previous relationship that I had, um, which was the healthiest I ever had, and just like people have been coming into my life, really positive influences, um, just over and over, just people, you know, like like running water, just positive affirmations and just real just you know like signs just kept coming in and just it, it was kind of like you know god smacking me in the face going like you are worthy shut the hell up like you are worthy like you're a good guy like you're smart you're smart you can do this like you're capable you know just, just despite your learning disability like you can you can do this because like, many people have come over adver many people have overcome certain adversities that you have and that i have um, to prove to ourselves the most and, you know, everybody else that, you know, we are capable just as much as the next guy or girl, 
to do whatever it is that they're doing that we, or what we want to do. And um, I finally built the courage to just start thinking, like, you know, like really accept the fact that, okay, this is the direction that I'm going in. And it, you know, accepted the fact that, that um, I really have a passion for people and caring for people. And I have a passion for playing drums and making, you know, making music for uh, the homeless, uh, for you know, mentally, physically handicapped, for just for people who are out, you know, on the streets, you know, enjoying themselves uh, on a Saturday night, going to dinner, going, going to a club. Because I'm also a street performer and I play drums, um, you know, for, for tips. And, uh, but what's more important to me is I, you know, I make people's night and I always do. It's always a great, it's always a great time. But um, I've had, a, for a long time, I've had, uh, things where like, I did, like just an, uh, you know, I did an issue just not knowing who I am and um, just going through the, just going through the motions in life and, and just trying to figure out who I am, uh, you know, what my purpose, what my purpose is. And, um, you know, cause when I, when I went to college, you know, my five, like, I mean, I'm going back to school for a reason. I didn't, I didn't go to school because I knew what I wanted to do at that time. I went to sc I went to college because, um, well, it was expected from my parents, and I just thought, well, that's the next thing you do is once you go to, once you go to high school, then you go to college. And I recommend to anybody um, if you don't know what you want to do, give yourself time, figure it out, like get a good idea, get a good general idea, then go to school instead of just you know not knowing what you want to do and going in, going to get a degree in something because, you know, um, you must change your mind and want to have a different career, which means you might have to go back to school and spend more money. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I got a degree in liberal arts, which is a customized degree. So I spent most of my degree in psychology and allied health sciences and music. And I did utilize it, you know, for a couple of years in social work, but um, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Even after the first two years of college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I just came up with, you know, a liberal arts degree because I just combined three things that I was just interested in. And I wasn't really sure what I want was, you know, was going to do. Um, you know, I'm not going to go and blame my parents for not preparing me for the universe or anything. Cause you know, it's, I, you know, after reading a couple of motivational books and, you know, self-help books, um, one of my favorite quotes, which I, I feel like is absolutely true. Um, in this book called, um, you are a badass and like you, like, is it how to realize that and live a better life? Cause we are, we are, we are all badasses. Um, is um one one of her quotes was it's not your fault that you were raised fucked up <laughs> but it is your fault if you let yourself stay fucked up yeah um and i i really take that to heart because um as you get older you notice a lot of adults that don't take the responsibility onto themselves to fix the, to to help themselves overcome with whatever um burden or you know damage that they had you know that they have experienced and carried on since childhood you know um and i you know working at the hospital i see it all the time i see people who just are there because they didn't want to take responsibility to take care of themselves even if they were told by their doctor that they have diabetes they need to take this medication and they need to like you know have this kind of diet there are people that come in you know from just totally disregarding doctor's orders or you know they Come in. I, 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 I've done plenty of time at the the ED, uh, you know, emergency department, where people come in from, you know, um, trying to kill themselves, the overdose, or you know, what, however method they try. And like people, you know, I, I you know, because I was a sitter at first, and I worked with lots of people who, um, before I became a CNA, I was a sitter, and I worked with lots of people who are just depressed or you know, trying to give up on life and stuff like that. And you know, it's just once you once you're exposed to just damaged souls who just like the one thing they all have in common I see is that they just give up. That's the one common trait that I see in everybody that comes in through that department or that comes in because they didn't, they didn't take care of themselves is that they just, they just give up. And that's sad. I mean, it's, 
it happens and it, it's really sad that people just give up and you know they they just you know hope to have a better life next like next time and you know um you know when you are exposed to something like that and you come home and you think you know you, you know you look at people's situation and, and you look at your own and you know you actually just thank god that you have your body you have your mind this is where you are you, you're glad that you have the head that you do that you have on your shoulders um if you're a strong person you know be thankful for that um that you have the will and care for yourself to be as best as you can the best version of you that you can be um it just motivates me more like you know after being around you know being around people like that it just i it it motivates me to try to overcome my own shit. And, um, you know, I try to read, um, like these Hinduism books. Cause I've been, I, I have a client from my second job, um, who's like a 83 yogi and, and he's been doing yoga for 20 years and, um, teaching meditation and just the science of, of the yogic science of, of mind, of breath and thought power. Cause really it's like, you know your your life it you know your your life as it unfolds is only unfolded in, it unfolds in a certain way because of the thoughts that you've had and the thoughts that you have do event they you know they become a prophet a fulfilled prophecy after a while you know they they may not be the thoughts they may have may not be existing you know external enough power and enough time to live inside your mind they do become a reality so i just feel like you know that one common trait that people have they give up you know like think of like what you could do if you just said fuck that i'm not giving up this is my life and you know i i am capable of doing the, like the great things that i want to do and you know i think i have a lot to offer this to this universe you know who who the hell is this who's the hell is to say to me that i can't do this shit fuck you and that's your opinion you know i you don't know me do, do you have my fucking head? no you don't, you don't have mine you have your mind it may be cynical and narcissistic but that's not me that's you so if you want to live that you know that that's your way you know and you know the only thing the only hope that you can the only hope for them to have that will save them from a world of misery and woe and just broken, you know, dreams and shit like that is to have that self-awareness of that, ha that have that self-awareness of the thoughts and the feelings and behaviors that you have that have not been serving your, your life. Well, that have led you to, uh, you know, you know, a wrong path. Or you know that's not helping you get to a better and brighter future. Uh, so it's just you know a combination of exposure to um, situations like that, and then having lots of positive people in my life, and a positive, uh, a very wonderful person who I used to be in a relationship with. Um, you know, just like all you know, all these uh, and, and the coworkers they have, and. Uh, I don't know, I guess just noticing the signs and just starting to like have faith and, and believe, you know, that it's, you know, things are like good things are possible and that you can, you know, you can do it. Like, you know, like everyone's saying, everyone's asking you, Hey, are you like, you know, are you in this? Are you, are you a nurse? Are you going to school? Uh, like, have you ever thought about going to school? You know, without even me saying anything, you know, people, you know, over and over, like you know, left and right, just tell you, Oh, like you make like a great nurse or, you know, you're really good at what you do. And then just after a while, like just the biggest thing for me was the voices in my head changed from being very self-defeating to being very like supportive. And it's gotten to the point where I don't force myself to think positively. It's just, it's just become an automatic thing. And eventually after a while in that, your confidence just, all of a sudden, like just one day, you know, I mean, do, you know, as you work on yourself and as you try to better yourself, you just come to a point where just like, you you know, it's like a, a you know, like a eureka moment where you actually believe viscerally 
in your bones that you are capable of achieving those those goals and ha have doing that kind of job and you are cap you're smart enough and you're strong enough and you're good enough and you're deserving enough to have a good life and that's kind of where um, my journey has been um, going from being um, you know very unaware about my you know, about myself and you know my and you know discovering my self worth and um learning how to love the person that I look in the mirror and just you know believe that I'm heading in the right direction and just go with you know what I like just um go with what I know about myself I'm a healer and I'm a musician and accepting those two made it a lot easier for me to narrow down my purpose in life and as you know, after my first two weeks of working at the hospital as a nurse aide, I'm like, this is where I'm at. This is this is where I'm meant to be. This is where I'm going to be, uh, and I'm going to thrive in it. And I, I've got a lot to offer, and um, I think I'm going to be a very good nurse. Um, and so now I'm just you know working my two jobs as a nurse aide, and you know also a nurse aide for home health care. And um, I'm going to go to a nursing informational session at a community college and try to get the ball rolling uh, with getting enrolled into uh, back into uh, school and just, you know, knock out those prerequisites that they want me to take before I get into the nursing program. I'm just going to knock this in there out of the ballpark and um, I'm going to I'm going to have my career and I'm going to have the life that I want. And uh, you should believe that you can have that, too, you know, because. Life's too hard. Life's too hard and cruel. You know, you know, the world can be a cold place, but you know, it can also be a beautiful place. And, you know, with who you surround yourself with, and you know, um, what kind of thoughts that you have in your mind, you know, really makes a big difference. Especially, and especially with who you hang out with, um, kind of speaks to you know, who, you know, how you see yourself. And uh, but you know, don't give it. Just don't. Just you know, ultimately, believe in yourself. Don't give a fuck about what other people think or, or say because no, no, nothing that they say is cemented into your future and so it, just nothing is nothing makes a, nothing that they say negatively is a defin, is a definitive uh, statement of who you really are. You know who you are. You know what you can do. You go out there. You just go fucking get it. <laughs>